Hello, everyone. I'm Eric Caldwell. I'm the chief executive here at the Ameren Foundation. And this week, I'd like to introduce you to a researcher who's been doing work here at the Ameren for eight years now. Uh, professor Lynn Loveless is a retired professor uh, of botany from the College of Worcester, uh, where she taught for nearly 30 years. Uh, in her eight years here on our campus, she's brought numerous students out to explore the natural resources of the Ameren and has conducted some really interesting research about a plant that I really want her to tell you about because she's the expert. So please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Loveless. Uh, Lynn, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, Eric. Thanks so much for inviting me to talk with you. Uh, well, you've told people that I used to be a college professor. I taught botany and ecology. My interests are in population biology and genetics of plants. And what that really means is I'm interested in populations of a species, meaning all the individuals of a particular species that kind of live in one area and might interact with each other. And I'm interested in kind of the dynamics of what those interactions are. Obviously, plants aren't getting up and moving around and competing by duking it out with their neighbors, but they share the same pollinators, they have the same set of herbivores, and so. That's sort of what my interest is. So I, here at the Ameren, I know you've been studying a plant that we commonly call the coral bean. Could you tell us a little bit more about that plant? Sure. The coral bean is a really interesting species that is really mostly native to Mexico. It reaches its northern limits of its distribution in southern Arizona. So it doesn't even go any further north than the Catalina Mountains. But within the area south of the Catalinas, between the border and the Catalinas, you find it on the Sky Island habitats in southeast Arizona. When did you develop your interest in the coral bean plant and why that plant, as opposed to any, all the other sorts of things you've researched? <laughs> well, I actually worked on a different species of erythrina in Panama so many years ago. And so I had a little bit of experience with the, the plant. The problem is the plants in Panama were trees, and it was really difficult to do the kinds of manipulations that I wanted to be able to do with the, with the flowers, bagging them to keep pollinators away and things like that. Actually, the erythrina that we have here, coral bean, is a tree in Mexico. But luckily, I'm not studying it in Mexico right now, I'm studying it here. And here, it's really, it's a, it's a shrub. What it really is, is a tree underground. And so the reason it's a shrub here is because it's frost sensitive. Uh, the, the stems get killed back in cold winters. And so what you see underneath the, at the base of the ground is this big woody caudex, this big, it's a trunk basically. And I can show you plants out in the Ameren that have giant woody bases and they have a couple stems, little branches coming up and they'll die back and new ones will come up. But it's really like a big woody base with these plants. So um, it's pollinated by hummingbirds and that was very interesting to me. Uh, and it also has another quality that has provoked some really interesting questions. And that is that each flower has at the base of the flower a nectary not inside the flower, but outside the flower on the base of the flower that attracts ants. These are called extra floral nectaries because they're outside the flower. I mean, they're not involved in pollination and they seem to be involved in attracting ants that help defend the plant against herbivores or, or bugs that eat the plant. So you said you have a big population of plants that you study here. How many plants do you study? And for those who don't know very much about the research botanists do, how did you go about identifying the plants and visiting them year after year? Um, well, Amarind is a really great place to look at erythrina. It's all over the place. And so initially, um, I set up a population. I could see that there were plants right along the roadside as I drove up. Into the, into the habitat. And so I found a place that had a good parking spot and I started walking off into the rocks and I started finding plants. I actually have, um, I have over 400 plants tagged 
at the amaranth right now. And the way they're distributed is the, the plants tend to grow in rocky areas, but not in the sort of sandier areas between the rock outcrops. So that means that the population is kind of subdivided. There are some areas that I do some kinds of work in and other areas that I do other kinds of work. But the initial population I set up was really just to follow the plant growth, size, flowering, and survival year to year. Um, but then I set up a, a population on the other side of the road that was more manipulative where I was able to take seeds and move things around and, um, and mess with it a little bit more. So I have sort of a pristine site and an experimental site. And, you know, we call it the coral bean because it has these bright red beans. It puts out a pod. And I understand those beans are, are toxic. Is that right? They are, yeah. No, I didn't talk at all about, I mean, it, it's called coral bean, but it's also got coral flowers. But the fruits are beans that are actually quite big. They, I mean, they're not a wimpy bean. They can have as many as 12 to 15 individual seeds in them. Thank you so much for your time today and telling us about your research. I know people have enjoyed your talks and other presentations, and you did a walk with us last year. Uh, and it's nice to be able to share this with a wider audience. So thank you so much for your time today, Lynn. Well, thank you, and thank you to the Amaranth for letting me work here.